verses 17 through 20, and we're looking today at Jesus who is the fulfillment of the law. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew. We've arrived at chapter 5. We've been looking at the uh, first portion of it would be the introduction to the sermon called the Beatitudes. We looked last time we were together at what have been referred to as the similitudes. And now we're moving into Jesus and his purpose, the purpose of Jesus, which is the fulfillment of the law. And so beginning at verse 17, reading to verse 20, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so as we've been looking at this uh, portion of scripture, when last together the Lord was giving to his followers, he was giving to us as believers he was giving to us our purpose. He had said that we are salt, and he said that we are light. So as salt, the church is at work almost invisibly in a sense, but as the salt is at work, it, it is being evidenced by a variety of things. And we looked at this together. We looked at our, our purity. We looked at our flavoring of this world as well as our, our call by God to preserve the world from corruption. When he speaks of us as being light, the church is to minister visibly. So we illuminate spiritual darkness of this world, and we do so by our lives. And so as he's been speaking about that, he's also made mention, and we saw this last time we're together in verse 16, that we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Now he is not saying that we are saved by works. That's an unfortunate belief amongst many who believe in a works-oriented salvation. They call that a works righteousness. You work and you become righteous. Well, that isn't what the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching. What Jesus was teaching is that if indeed we are salt, if indeed we are light, then that is going to be demonstrated by a life that is dedicated to, to good works or works that are done from a pure heart. And so we're not saved by good works because we're saved by the grace of God. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, if I could work my way into a righteousness, I could boast about how righteous I am. But I am saved by the grace of God through faith. But after I am saved, good works is what is referred to as the, the fruit that reveals that I've been saved, as well as demonstrating my purpose. My purpose is for good works. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says uh, that Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous, he says, for good works. Ephesians 2.10, Paul said it like this. He said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so he has spoken to us concerning our purpose, but after proclaiming the purpose of the church, he now discloses a portion of his own purpose. And he makes it clear in this passage, he didn't come to destroy their faith, but he came to complete it. He's going to make it clear that the law and the prophets actually are pointing to him. And so as the Lord speaks concerning this, he says something in verse 18, when he says, I, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So what he's saying here, at least a portion of what he is saying, is that the Bible is God's word, and he is saying that it can be trusted completely. The Bible is God's word, and it can be trusted. Why do we, as Christians, and why do I, as a pastor, why do I emphasize the word of God? Jesus said it is God's word and can be com completely trusted. Now, there is an individual, some of us have heard his name mentioned before. His name is Richard Dawkins. 
Richard Dawkins is a well-known atheist. He's almost what you would call a Billy Graham of atheism, if you will. He wrote a book called The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins. And this is an excerpt from it. Richard Dawkins said, to be fair, much of the Bible is not systematically evil, but just plain weird, as you would expect of a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents composed, revised, translated, distorted, and improved by hundreds of anonymous authors, editors, and copyists, unknown to us and mostly unknown to each other, spanning nine centuries. Now that's Richard Dawkins' take on the Word of God. It's chaotic. It's a cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents. It has hundreds of anonymous authors and editors and copyists, etc. And so he's basically simply saying, what do you expect from a book that you can't trust? The question is, is that accurate? You know, there are those who would say that Jesus Christ, because Jesus quoted scripture and Jesus Christ believed in his inerrancy and infallibility, that it's simply because Jesus was just not as, as intelligent as they are. There are those, I've read their quotes, where they have stated, well, if Jesus Christ had the information that they have now, he wouldn't have believed what he says he believed as he was proclaiming the things that he spoke during his day. Is that true? Is the Bible just a chaotically put together, composed by men, confusing, disjointed account of somebody's mythological belief of creation and redemption and things of that nature? Let me give you a few Bible facts that might help you. When I would, I would begin by quoting D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. And so he gives to us the purpose of Scripture, some basic Bible facts. Though it contains 66 books divided among the Old and New Testaments, 39 books in the Old, 27 in the New, the Bible is looked at and understood as one book. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. The Apostle Paul wrote 14 books over half of the New Testament. It was written over a period of 1,500 years from around 1450 B.C. to about 100 A.D. The Bible was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by over 40 different authors from all walks of life, shepherds, farmers, tent makers, physicians, fishermen, priests, philosophers, and kings. Despite these differences in occupation and the span of years it took to write it, the Bible is extremely cohesive and unified. The Bible was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. There are 23,145 verses in the Old Testament, 7,957 verses in the New Testament, giving us a total of 31,102 verses. The perfect agreement of these writers is one proof that a single author guided them all. The author was God. Even though many writers wrote the Bible over many years, there are no contradictions. One author does not contradict any of the others. The Bible has been translated into 2018 languages with countless more partial translations and audio translations for unwritten languages. In comparison, Shakespeare, considered by many to be the master writer of the English language, has only been translated into 50 languages. The Bible reveals the mystery of God's plan, which is the unifying theme of the Bible. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ as the savior of sinful mankind. Jesus explained how the Old Testament centered on him, and Jesus makes it clear that all is fulfilled in him. And that's what we're looking at here in this passage when the Lord Jesus Christ says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. As we begin, the, the Jews are being told, the Jewish nation are being told that they will not become righteous on their own by following the law of Moses. The answer is because the reason they cannot become righteous that way is because the law pointed to and is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
When Paul was writing to the Roman church in Romans 10, verse 4, he said, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When he said Christ is the end, the word end there is the Greek word talos. The word end means termination, the limit at which a thing ceases to be or its close. It speaks that the law was pointing to Jesus and found its completion in him. You see, the Pharisees accused Jesus of ignoring and breaking Moses' law. They thought that because he, he because he healed on the Sabbath, he was dishonoring it. And they also believed that he was guilty of blasphemy because he declared himself to be the Son of God. Now, Jesus certainly appeared by their standard of interpretation to devalue the law of Moses. And you can see that as we studied through Matthew in at least three ways. One is, and this is why they would think that about him, he, he did not observe and agree with their oral traditions that they had. You see, according to rabbinic Judaism, the oral law represents the laws, statutes, and legal interpretations that were not recorded in the first five books of Moses, which is the written law, but were regarded as equally binding. According to Jewish tradition, the oral law was passed down orally in an unbroken chain from generation to generation until its contents were fully committed to writing following the destruction of the second temple. And so they had laws that are called traditions that they held fast to that they considered to be equal to the written law of Moses. You're going to see here in Matthew chapter 5 how many times the Lord Jesus Christ will actually correct that. You'll see it, for example, in verse 21 when it says, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, but then notice verse 22, how he goes on to say, but I say, You'll see it in verse 27, where he says, you have heard that it was said, and then verse 28, but I say. Verse 31, it has been said. Verse 32, but I say. And so Jesus does that throughout chapter 5. And as he does that, he's saying you're in error, and your oral traditions are not correct. And he was establishing himself as being the authority. So they did not appreciate that at all. Second, he interpreted the law according to the spirit of the law and not the letter. In Matthew 15, verse 6, Jesus said that they had made the commandment of God of no effect by their traditions. So Jesus would speak concerning the spirit of the law. And then third, he ignored their traditional way of teaching because he taught with heaven's authority. You're going to see that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, where it says there, So it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You see, when Jesus would teach, he did not quote some other rabbi. He didn't say, well, Rabbi Hillel says this, or Rabbi Shammai says that, Rabbi Gamaliel says this. He didn't say things like that. What he said is, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And that was such an amazing way of teaching that they saw that Jesus was establishing himself as the authority. And because of these breaks with the religious tradition, he was open to the accusation that he did not honor the law of Moses. That's why he begins by saying, do not think. In other words, do not think that I'm subverting the law of God or ignoring the prophets. He says, I came. He says, and I have come. In other words, don't think this because I have been sent on a divine mission by my Father. Like it says in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's saying, as Messiah, I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The word fulfill means to establish. I've come to establish the law and the prophets. Now, when he speaks concerning the law and the prophets, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. The law and prophets represent the entire Old Testament because those who wrote scripture were regarded as prophets. So Jesus is revealed in the law and prophets, so he didn't come to destroy, he came to fulfill. So there is a definite link between the past and the present. The law of God is necessary because the people needed to appreciate the gospel that was coming. See, when you read your Bible and you begin to look at what was called the law and its purpose, there are a variety of things that the law was intended to do for the people of Israel. For example, when you read the law, you were actually having the will of God revealed to you by God's word. Like what Paul says in Romans 2.18, know his, and know his will, approve the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. So the law revealed the will of God. 
but the law also required total obedience. Paul again in Romans 2 verse 13 said, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. There's something about the law that it does. It also condemns. In Romans 3.19, we know that what things the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God. So the law actually condemns. The law defines sin. Romans 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, you shall not covet. The law had a fruit. It, it produced death. Romans 7, 9 says, I felt fine when I did not understand what the law demanded. But when I learned the truth, I realized I had broken the law and was a sinner doomed to die. But the law also was intended to lead people to faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.24, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So there was a purpose in the law. You see, when the law was given, there are many commands in it, and people thought that those commands were odious. They thought that those commands were harsh and, or difficult, and, and they didn't like it, you know, because it tells us what not to do so much, and you know, all. but God's law was intended to keep us safe. There are a lot of things that when you're first told not to do a certain thing, that you think whoever it is that's telling you not to do that is raining on your parade, your joy parade. You wanted to do these things. How come you're saying I can't do that? How come you're saying I can't do these things? You know, children are that way. If the father or the mother says, no, you can't do a certain thing, very often the, the kid thinks the mom and dad are raining on their parade that, that mom and dad don't understand them. You know, man, what's wrong with you? You don't understand how much fun I'd have by doing these things. How come you're telling me to come home at a certain time? Or how come you're telling me I shouldn't uh, hang around with certain people? You don't know their heart. You don't know the way that they are. And we've all been guilty of doing that one way or another. And uh, our children are equally guilty because they receive a sin nature. And the sin nature usually comes from their mom, but we'll talk about that soon. Actually, it comes from the father. My mom used to tell me not to do things all the time. I've told you guys this. Some of you haven't heard this before, but it comes to mind. Mama used to say, stay away from fire. But I liked fire. I thought fire was cool. And so I would, you know, I just liked it. Um, and my mama used to smoke. My mom smoked until she got saved. I used to go and, and buy her cigarettes. They, she used to write me a little note, please give my son one package of her favorite cigarettes. She it used to be a quarter. You who are laughing are smokers, huh? It used to be a quarter. <laughs> I could tell by your cough. And... Um, <laughs> And I would go down the street and I would buy these uh, her cigarettes and I'd bring them back to her. So mama, mama smoked since she was in her early teens. So I was raised in a home with a smoking mom and she was smoking. And I, I used to really appreciate uh, how cool my mom looked. Oh, my mom looked so cool when she smoked. She really, oh, she, she was so cool. She would, she would put the cigarette in her mouth and she'd go to the stove and turn the burner on and then she'd lean over and she'd just take a, and then she'd pull her head back and she'd take a hit off her cigarette and then she'd let the smoke just kind of gently fall out of her mouth till it went to her eyes and she had this real smoky kind of cool look, you know. And I thought, man, you know, my mama is so cool and, and especially the way she just lights that cigarette and she just kicks back. And So when I got older, I started smoking when I was about, I don't know, 12, 13, and I, I, I would actually take her cigarettes. But I can remember I was about 15 at the time. I used to have a, a pompadour, you know, where you kind of like smooth it out, like, and it's kind of cool, you know, like that, and a ducktail, and the whole nine yards. And, and I just wanted to be so cool. And so I got my cigarette, and I went to the burner, and I turned it on, and I, and my hair caught on fire because it, <laughs> it had, and all this, hairspray, you know, and, and it just blew up. You know, I looked like Wiley e. Coyote. My hair was smoking, and I had, it, it all frizzed up. It just frizzed. You know how it is when, when the fire hits, hits hair, it just kind of frizzes. So I had an afro. I had the first afro in Norwalk back in 65. But my mom used to say, stay away from the fire. And I used to think that my mom 
was just, just you know, not cool. I mean, come on, you know, fire is cool. And then I discovered that, no, there's a reason for that law. There was a reason for that command because fire burns. And there are so many things that my parents, I really thought that they were just, just not really in, you know, aware of what, what life was all about when I was a kid. Stay away from drinking. David, don't be smoking. My mom gave up smoking when she got saved, you know, and didn't smoke again for over 40 years. You know, stay away from these things. You know, it wasn't to destroy, it was to build up. The law awakens you to what is right and wrong and then also awakens you, Moses' law, to your own sinfulness. Then causes you to say, oh, what a wretched person I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death? When you finally get to that point where you, you, the will is with you, the ability to perform that which you desire is not, when you are awakened to the reality that you're not able to do that which you say you want to do so much, the law is performing its purpose because you're able to name the thing that is the hidden thing in your life that you're so miserable about. So this is called adultery. So this is called coveting. So this is called alcoholism. So this, that's what it, and that's what the law does. And then as it awakens you to your inability to perform that which God has commanded you to do, because it expects your obedience, not the one who knows it, but the one who does it is justified. That's when you find yourself to be totally sold to sin and helpless. And that's when it becomes the tutor who takes you to the Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it so that we might have a relationship with him. Now the prophets wrote concerning the coming Messiah. And they wrote in their writings that Messiah would come. Luke 18, 31 gives us an incident where he took the 12 aside, said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. After his resurrection, he was speaking to two disciples. He was on the road to Emmaus. It's recorded in Luke 24, 25. He said to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Luke 24, 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. See, we Christians have prophecy that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We can trust the word of God because it's accurate. So he's saying, I've come to complete these writings because they're written concerning me. Notice in verse 18 how he says, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means uh, pass away from the law. So a jot is the tenth and smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. A tittle is, a, is like an apostrophe, if you will. They're small is the point he's making. So what is he saying here? Well, when he says these things will not pass away, he's saying, one, God's word is permanent. God's word is permanent. Like it says later on in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Or Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Or again, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So God's word is permanent. He's also saying it is precise. The prophecies were precisely fulfilled in him. The law is precisely fulfilled in him. And according to Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So it is precise. And finally, it is also trustworthy. It will be accomplished. Numbers 23.19 says it well. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, shall he not do it? Or has he spoken? Shall he not make it good? God isn't a liar. God's word can be trusted. So Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. Jesus died as the perfect offering. So Paul would say in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so God's word can be trusted. 
But notice what he goes on to say in verse 19. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now that's really important. When he says, therefore, whoever therefore breaks, that word break, it speaks of annulling something. It speaks of making something void. To release yourself from its requirements. It, it speaks of someone thinking that God's commands don't apply to them. God's commands don't apply to them. We have in, in our society, uh, many of us, who think that the laws of the land really don't apply to us. We're above the laws. They apply to other people, but they don't apply to me because somehow I, I'm not having to keep the laws of this land. And, and all of us in this room could immediately say, yeah, I know somebody who does that, but, but I have to say I know myself, and I know how I can do that, and I know how I can explain away why I just broke the law. I know I can do that. I know that I'm driving somewhere, and I can see that the speed limit's 45. But that really applies to other people, doesn't it? Because there's nobody on the road, just me. And there's a five-mile-per-hour cushion, isn't there? And you can just do that. Stop signs. Stop signs are suggestions. <laughs> you roll up, and there's nobody there. Right? I mean... Double yellow lines, they're there for other people because if I'm in a hurry and that person in front of me is going so slow, they don't know how important my time is and I've got to get there, so I'll just kind of go around them. We do that, and that's what the simplest things. We do that. Human beings have a tendency of saying, those things don't apply to me. They apply to other people. And it's funny because we may do something we shouldn't do, and then we see that sin in somebody else and we condemn them. We say, oh, man, look at that person. He's got to be going at least 75. How do you know that? Because I'm right on him. <laughs> Laws apply to other people. That's a human foible. That's something that we are all guilty of. And Jesus is speaking about this in the, in the spiritual sense of the word. Of course, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, the Jews had 613 commandments. We'll see that later on, and I'll give you more detail. They had what were called the light commandments, and they had what are called the binding or the heavy ones. The light ones were, were, were obviously less important in their mind to the heavy or the binding ones. And so there is possible uh, for them to, to say, well, that's not that important, but this one is more important. And the Lord is making it clear that they're equally important. God's word is God's word. It's equally important. And you need to keep his commandments. So when somebody is keeping the commandments, it's, it's a demonstration of a sincerity that they have concerning the importance of the word of God. You see, because our attitude towards God's word reveals our degree of devotion to him. Psalm 119, 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 127, therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. So Jesus is basically saying it's bad enough to willingly disregard what seems to be the least commandment, but it's compounded by teaching others to do the same. And when a rabbi is teaching his pupil to disregard one and to elevate another, Jesus said you're not teaching them balance, and therefore you're not doing the right thing. Obedience to the word of the Lord is really an indicator that you know the Lord. Somebody said if a man pretending to be Christ's disciple encourages himself in any allowed disobedience to the holy law of God, or teaches others to do the same, whatever his station or reputation among men may be, he can be no true disciple. Christ's righteousness, imputed to us by faith alone, is needed by everyone that enters the kingdom of grace or of glory. But the new creation of the heart to holiness produces a thorough change in a man's temper and conduct. You see, fallen human nature attempts to find ways around obedience. But Jesus' point, very simple, it's not permissible to ignore or modify even the least of my commands. 
And again, to teach others to do the same is wrong. My understanding of the Word of God and its importance is of immense importance in my spiritual life. What is the Bible to you? What does it mean to you? All of us have heard the name Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was not a Christian by any means. He was a, a Hindu. But Gandhi said something worthy of quoting. Gandhi said, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, turn the world upside down, and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. Now, isn't that an amazing assessment? You have got in your hands the most powerful document God ever gave to man, and you treat it the way you treat People magazine. That's what he's saying, in essence, bringing it up to 2015. The word of God, obedience to it, love for it, teaching it properly. In, in, in our day, we have pastors who are afraid to teach the whole counsel of God because it offends sensitive hearers. They don't want to hear it because our society immediately is going to look at us as haters because we teach the whole counsel. That's just a fact, and that's what's going on even right now. I was asked by a local newspaper to make a comment on the situation that was recently experienced at Chino High School with a man who declared himself to be a woman and I was received a phone call and they asked me a question concerning it and I said this is what I said to the church on Sunday gave the whole pretty much the whole excerpt transcript of what I given where I said to this church I said it's a teaching moment for us we can teach our children about what it means to be a man or a woman it's just an opportunity for us but we need to be careful not to be haters. We have to be careful not to show uh, any kind of, or teach our kids to respond in any way that doesn't honor the Lord. That's what I said. So they take an excerpt from what I said, and, and they take one that could be the most intolerant appearing statement. So our door-to-door -door ministry just yesterday is knocking on doors, sharing with people about the good news of the gospel. And one of the houses, one of the people who lived in the house that they were walking up to and talking to asked them, are you from that church that David Rosales pastors? Yes, I am. And then gave him an earful of how evil I am. And that, that happened to be Marie. She was just, you know, she, <laughs> she shouldn't have said that. It's not right. But that's what happens. You, you can expect that because... That intolerance is not the church. Of all people, Christians are most tolerant because we see so much sin and we're able to love and care for and minister to in spite of that. Of all people, you are the most tolerant because you don't go out and cut people's heads off because you're not out there damaging people's property. What you're doing is loving them and telling them the truth that they might be set free. But what happens is people think that we are just unloving well, we don't want to ignore the word of God, and we also do not want to teach someone else to do the same. Every believer is a teacher, and when you disregard his word, you do come under stricter judgment. Somebody said, why is it that some Christians, although they hear many sermons, make but slow advances in the divine life? Because they neglect their closets and do not thoughtfully meditate on God's word. They love the wheat, but they do not grind it. They would have the corn, but they will not go forth into the fields to gather it. The fruit hangs upon the tree, but they will not pluck it. The water flows at their feet, but they will not stoop to drink it. From such folly deliver us, O Lord. So we need the word of God and we need to obey it. He says, if you disregard it and teach others also, you are least, he says, in the kingdom. In other words, your reward in heaven will suffer. 
In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, it says, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, yet as through fire. You see, we need to be careful to guard our lives, like it says in 2 John 8, where it says, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Those who are faithful receive a full reward. And that's how we ought to live, and that's what we ought to be doing. And the teachers of the law should be teaching the whole counsel of it. And then finally, in verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he closes with a, a warning to live a genuinely spiritual life and not one that is only lived on the outside. You see, by outward appearance, the Pharisees were considered truly and exceedingly righteous. But Jesus in Matthew 23 says it this way in verses 25 through 28. He says, how terrible it will be for you teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence, blind Pharisees. First wash the inside of the cup, and then the outside will become clean too. How terrible it will be for you teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, filled with, on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. It isn't the outside, it's what's on the inside. My dad had a coffee cup that he brought back with him when he served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. It was his special coffee cup. He drank his coffee in the morning with, uh, out of this cup. And, and, um, and every morning I can remember as a little boy, my mom would, would make the coffee for my dad. And, and as I got older, I got, the, I got the task. And for me, it was an honor to, to bring the coffee cup filled with my dad's coffee to him as he was reading the newspaper in his room and I would bring his coffee cup. It was like holy service, you don't s spill a drop of this coffee. And I used to carry it to my dad in the morning when I was a little boy. And when I got a little bit older, maybe nine or 10, my mom said, okay, your dad takes his coffee this way, go get him a cup of coffee. Now I've just advanced into real servanthood. And so I remember going in and getting my dad's coffee cup and getting very carefully, getting the, the uh, coffee pot. They used to have what they called coffee pots and we put coffee in it, and, and I carried it. And I was just a little guy, and I carried it very carefully, and I brought it, and I gave it to my dad. And my dad said, oh, son, thank you very much. And I stood there watching as he took his first drink of his coffee, and he spit it out. And he goes, oh. He goes, what is this? And he looks into it. Well, my mom had taken the coffee grounds, and had put them in, in, uh, in a uh, piece of paper, uh, paper towel and had stuffed it in my dad's coffee cup and so I actually just poured the coffee over that coffee grounds and but the outside looked good the outside looked perfect it was on the inside that there was a problem and I've never forgotten that because a lot of us can put on our Sunday go to meeting faces our Sunday go to meeting clothes and we can, we can go to church and we can look good and we can have that appearance. And that's what Jesus is speaking about. And he's saying, listen, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees who amongst the people were the most righteous people in their society. When you saw a scribe, saw a Pharisee, you would see them as people who prayed, people who gave, people who fasted. They did these things. They were outwardly righteous. And all the people said, I can't memorize like them. I can't speak like they do. I can't quote like they do. I don't know any of the things that they, they are very righteous. And Jesus said, no, they're not. They're like tombs that are filled with decay. That's what they are. They are careful to clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is filled with all kinds of impurity. So that's what he's saying. It's not that you shouldn't have a righteous life. It's why do I have a righteous life? What has given my life a righteousness? And it has to be 
because Jesus has fulfilled the law of Moses, fulfilled the word of the prophets, and I have committed myself to the one who did what I cannot do. Righteousness comes when we humbly receive forgiveness for our sins through Jesus, who fulfilled his Father's demands. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all those who believe, there's no difference. The righteousness comes through faith. And that's what Jesus is pointing to. Don't wear your righteousness on the outside. Become righteous within through faith in him.